Good morning, everybody. This is Kirk Spano, and it is once again Friday the 13th. It seems like we just had one of these. So we are looking at a small rally in the stock market today after yesterday's epic 2,300-point, 10% down day on the S&P 500. And the economy is now in the grips of the coronavirus. And as I discussed a while back in a few articles, uh, this was coming with or without coronavirus. We were going to get a valuation correction on slower earnings and slower GDP growth. Coronavirus, however, has supercharged uh, this downturn. And we are, as of right now, we are likely in a recession. So it is important to understand what a recession is. According to the BLS, it's a general slowdown in economic activity. It is not the two quarters of negative growth that people like to throw around on the internet and the talking heads on TV. We are seeing a massive slowdown in the global economy. It's going to end up wiping out somewhere between three and six trillion dollars of global GDP growth. In the United States, we are likely to see GDP uh, growth fall to zero over the next two quarters and possibly go negative. My guess is that we probably have one negative quarter and then a mediocre rebound uh, followed by a greater rebound next year. Why do I think that? Well, I'm in my fifth major city now in a month. Excuse me. And the pro progression um, from less busy to almost completely ghost townish um, has been amazing. The quickness of the slowdown uh, really has been, as a guy who paid attention to that, uh, amazing to see. And to see pictures from around the country of Costco's and Sam's Club and Walmarts and grocery stores without things on the shelf, I just it just blows me away. So let's just talk a little bit about the seriousness of the coronavirus. There's a lot of bad information out there. If you go to the World Health Organization, you can get a daily update. So I'm not going to give my opinion. I'm just going to tell you what the CDC and the World Health Organization are saying. Essentially, the coronavirus spreads like the flu. So it is very contagious. Will we end up seeing as many people get this as we do the flu? Probably not, because we are shutting down things all over the country. NBA, Major League Baseball, as of this morning, the NFL, all restricting movement. Uh, the NBA has shut down its season. Major League Baseball has delayed their season. Uh, spring training, I'm in Arizona right now, is canceled. The NCAA basketball tournament is canceled. Concert tours all over the country are canceled. So we probably are doing a decent job of slowing the spread of the disease. There's a brand new test that have got FDA approval today uh, that is 10 times faster than the previous test. So we will have very good testing within a month or two. So that's great. Uh, and what the numbers are likely to show is that more people got it um, than we thought earlier. A couple of people who are doctors in our group uh, showed the progressions and we should probably expect over 100,000 infections as soon as that many tests have been given. Uh, it, it's going to be a pretty quick ramp up in the next two to four weeks. Well, I didn't mention school systems all over the country are going to online classes or extended breaks. So it is a major economic event, even if you don't feel like it should be because uh, you're of the opinion that this isn't any worse than the flu. The reality is that if it had spread like the flu, 
and our interventions probably prevented that, somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 times more people would have died versus the flu. So it's important to set ideology aside and just look at the, the scientific data and the math. Um, had we allowed this to spread like the flu 10 to 20 times more people would have died. Uh, but because we are intervening, it probably won't spread like the flu. Social distancing, fewer public events, um, and, a, and, and basically trying to build a gap into it so that it fizzles out. What we know is that the CDC and World Health Organization have been looking for disease X ever since SARS. And what is disease X? It's something that spreads like the flu or a cold, but is many times more deadly. Coronavirus is not disease X because it doesn't have a double digit death rate. Uh, like I said, the death rate is going to end up being between 1% and 2%, it looks like. But what we should be aware of is that this is a shot across the bow that is going to change the economy forever. And anybody who doesn't believe that is just not paying attention. There's going to be more people working from home forever now. Now, that was a change that was coming, but you have old line managers uh, who don't like the idea of their people working from home. They're going to have to get used to it now because it's going to be a regular thing. That doesn't mean that everybody will work from home 24-7, uh, but it means that uh, there will be a lot more days where people don't have to come into the office and they work remotely. I welcome that change because I'm trying to travel more, and uh, I would love for my girlfriend to have a job where she doesn't have to go into the office half the time. So what else will that change? Well, think about what we're looking at now with the energy futures. What if U.S. oil consumption drops by a million barrels a day permanently? I think that not only is that a possibility, it's a probability. We are probably going to consume about a million barrels less per day during this crisis, but it's not all going to come back six months or a year from now. The United States probably, as of right now, as of a month ago, or it maybe last summer, I'd have to see where, the, where we peaked out in oil usage, the United States will probably never, ever experience oil demand growth ever again. Why is that important? Because the United States is the second biggest user of oil in the world right now, uh, along with China. I'd have to double check those numbers again. I don't know if we're a little more than them or they're a little more than us. Um, I'm guessing that we probably still use more. In any case, the Chinese have been moving massively towards uh, electrified buses, and they're going to take a big push on EVs, uh, and they're probably going to go more towards working remotely as well. That's the same thing that we're going to do. So the two biggest economies and oil users in the world are going to move towards working more remotely, and they're ahead of us in electrification, but we're going to catch up rapidly if what I saw at CES, a consumer electronics show in Las Vegas in January, pans out. As I've discussed with you, the uh, rules for mileage um, are are set to get much more strict in the next five years. And by 2025, you should expect that the last models of internal combustion engine uh, cars are being sold. Now, there's going to still be sports cars and things like that and, and high-end cars, but the mass market internal combustion engine cars, the last models are probably going to be 2025 or 2026. Ford has talked about it, GM has talked about it, Volkswagen, Volvo, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, go right down the list. So you're not arguing with me or your neighbor or the guy at the bar. The car companies are telling you they're moving away from oil and gas. And it's coming pretty fast. It's only several years out. 
General Motors just had a huge uh, battery breakthrough, and we expect one from Tesla soon, and I'm sure there's others on the horizon from Panasonic and Hyundai and everybody else who's in that market. Exclusively using lithium and cobalt anymore, and they're going to continue to move away from the more toxic batteries, the less toxic batteries, to hold a better charge and are lighter. So air-type batteries, from lithium air to zinc air, um, to other batteries that are more liquid in nature, are all on the horizon. And we're not talking 10 or 20 years out. We're talking two, three, four, five, six years out. Battery technology is moving very fast. So as you know, I announced that I had gotten rid of all of my oil investments, uh, oil stocks, I should say. Um, I have sold some puts on crude oil um, because I believe two things. One, I think you're going to see massive bankruptcies in the oil patch from the shock. Not only the coronavirus slowing the economy down, but of course, Saudi Arabia deciding we're just going to pump as much oil as we can because we're the cheapest oil. And they're trying to create a time period of five, six, seven years where they can get a lot of money out of their oil because they know demand is going to crater within about a decade. So you've all seen my chart where I say that oil demand falls precipitously after 2030. I get arguments about it all the time. But when the car companies say they're going to stop selling gasoline cars in the middle of the decade, you know, at least the mass market ones, and you have this huge move towards solar and energy and battery storage, not only at the residential level, but at the utility level, and now the commercial level, it should be very apparent what is coming. So coronavirus has been, as I, I mentioned in a couple articles ago, was the match that lit, lit the overvaluation fire. And now we're seeing valuations come back to more reasonable levels across the board. It's also the match that is going to help change the energy system. So I am going to be cranking out a lot of articles over the next two or three weeks about all the various impacts. And then as we go on to earnings, we will see it. So earnings are probably going to be much lower in the next couple of quarters. If you've never been to Yardenia Research, this is one that you should bookmark. They have a lot of great free stuff. This is one of their chart books. And I want you to take a look at the GDP projections for 2020. Q2, we're looking at zero GDP growth. In Q3, they're saying half a percent. This should scream out at you recession. It's very obvious that's what's happening. So what happens to earnings? If you go to any of these uh, websites that have earnings updates, I use Market Watch all the time because I was writing for them for a while. Um, you start to see, okay, here's the story, but what does it mean? And companies like Slack are getting more used, but they're not going to earn a lot more money because the, the subscriptions were already there. They're just getting used more. So we're going to see a lot of this. This is profit, profit and revenue expectations in the next quarter. Some of the industries that are getting hit the hardest are obviously travel and hospitality and restaurant related. You may be able to get some of those stocks for dirt cheap soon. They're cheaper now, but not dirt cheap. One stock that I'm going to show you, and I'm not going to go over many stocks, I'm just going to go over indexes mainly, is Boeing. So when Boeing was $400 a share, and in the 300s, uh, I put in a bottom fishing price uh, in the very low 100s, which implied a 40% drop in the share price. And people laughed at me. They said, you're out of your mind, Boeing will never go back down to around $200 a share. Well, here we are at 170 and it's not just coronavirus. It's the fact that the 737 MAX has been a bomb. So 
this is a company that I think we ought to be paying attention to because we are going to see it rebound at some point. What we don't know is how low it can go. If you pull this chart out, you see there's a pretty big resistance level down here at about $130 a share, maybe $140 a share. I haven't bought any Boeing yet. I wouldn't blame you if you did, though. I think at that $130 to $140 uh, a share price, I think you just hold your nose and you buy it. Why? Because air travel is going to come back in a year or two. We're going to have better testing. We're going to have vaccines. Uh, now that we are aware of this uh, coronavirus, you know, and we already knew, um, but this is where huge amounts of research have been getting thrown out for the last month or two, and it's going to continue. So there are going to be vaccines or f annual shots uh, that are similar to the annual flu shots. And I got my first flu shot this year. I've never had one before. But I figured, heck, turning 50, moving in with a girlfriend, having a grandchild, might as well get a flu shot too. And uh, I'm kind of glad I did. I don't know if it's helped anything. Uh, but I don't have the flu, so that's at least good. Um, keep an eye on Boeing. I'll probably send out a buy alert at some point, and I can't imagine this stock doesn't have a great run. Now, that doesn't mean it can't go sideways and be choppy for a year or two. It pays a decent dividend. I don't know if that's going to get cut. That's what I have to evaluate. Um, but at some point, you know, they have to replace an awful lot of airplanes that are getting old, along with Airbus. So this is a stock that I think uh, we should keep an eye on. It is one of the 12 stocks on my must-own list. Um, so we were getting close to the point of wanting to buy Boeing. There's other stocks that are getting close as well. Uh, some of the technology names have come down through those first support levels, and we should probably take a look at those. So let's take a look at S&P 500. In fact, let's uh, do this. So here's your S&P 500. We are at those 2018 lows, which I said was pretty much guaranteed way up here. I, I, I told people as it went up, we're going to see the 2018 lows again. Again, this was going to happen with or without coronavirus. It just happened faster and harder with it. We're at those 2018 lows yesterday, and now we're bouncing up a little bit. But there's another support level. Um, there's actually more support levels. This is the one I'm most concerned with. I think you can see um, the S&P 500 break through that 220, 240 range, which is in here that I had targeted. I think 190-ish could be an ultimate low on the S&P 500. And of course, the twin tops of 2000 and 2007 Well, that looks horrible. Let's see what it looks like here. Oh, printing too long, good. But the twin taps of 2000 and 2007 are what we should be looking at as the ultimate low spot for the S&P 500 if we, in fact, get a financial crisis uh, driven probably by bad debt. Right, so we have not only oil companies that are going to struggle to pay debt, but cruise companies, um, restaurants. There's a lot of junk debt out there right now that's in trouble. The Fed is going to have to bail that out. Yesterday they announced a trillion and a half dollar um, uh, program that is essentially they're going to try to support the, the debt market. So that's really where the huge risk is, is what if the debt markets start to collapse? That's a big deal. So we could see this double top again. So 
of the S&P 500, which would put us down at about 160 on SPY, right? So as the market goes up, hits resistance, comes back, test resistance, then finally breaks through. Then it becomes support. So this level down around 160 um, is possible. I don't know that that will happen, but it's possible. We should keep an eye on the debt markets more than anything else. If the junk bond market starts to collapse, then the equities are going to collapse as well. So we'll see how effective the Federal Reserve is in preventing a junk market bond collapse. Um, but make make no uh, bones about it here. I don't don't doubt this. There's a lot of companies that have to unwind, and it's going to take years. So remember those hundreds to 150 companies in the S&P 500 that I said were at risk over the next 10 years. Of, of really losing half their value or going to zero. Right? I was talking about that way ahead of the coronavirus. Coronavirus has accelerated that. A lot of these companies are going to be challenged to meet their debt obligations over the next few years, and they're never going to recover because their businesses are slow growth. So where the companies have growth, they'll muddle through. Doesn't mean their equity prices will do very well. So the S&P 500, I think, is a damaged index for years and years and years. The index that we want to be in is QQQ, right? So there's major support levels down starting around 150, all the way down to one, you know, the 120. Where if QQQ got into this range, I think it's a no-brainer buy. You know, we got down. We broke through this minor support that I had laid out for you, and we'll see if we bounce back up. I don't know if we're going to hold it term. So be careful with QQQ. There might be another 50 points down, 25%, give or take, 30%, give or take. Uh, we, we just don't know how effective the government response will be. Um, I've seen what Nancy Pelosi is trying to do. Um, I'm sure she's going to give in on a couple things with President Trump. Um, but what she's trying to do is pretty good uh, as far as supporting the economy. Uh, but it's not going to be an artificial prop the market up sort of bailout. So keep that in mind is she's pushing for things like extended unemployment benefits, um, ways to stay home and get paid sick leave. I think ultimately the government's going to have to pay that. I don't think you can put it on the corporations. So I think you might see, in addition to the Family Leave Act, um, maybe it's triggered by health, you know, national health events, where you get 12 up to 12 weeks of of unemployment um, during a national health event. So I, th I think ultimately what they do is they just really loosen up the unemployment benefits, right? So if you have to stay home uh, because of a health issue, you're eligible for unemployment. I think that's a smart way to go about it. I got to think that that's what they're thinking. Um, that's what I've read. So we'll see. So if, if folks aren't starving and they can keep their houses and everything like that, I think that's really what's coming. Uh, they're trying to do that. I don't think you're going to see uh, the payroll tax holiday. I just, I, I don't see it coming. I mean, I'd, I'd actually like to see it come, but on top of all those other things, I think that this bailout needs to be, you know, 2% of a uh, $20 trillion economy. So it's got to be at least, you know, you know, pushing a trillion dollars. And, well, then we have to ask ourselves, boy, we're still we're starting to spend an awful lot of trillions, right? So at some point, um, that's going to end up in the devaluation of the currency. So what have I been buying? Our gold stocks have come all the way back into that support region. So one of the two things I bought today is I bought GDX. If you take a look at all the stocks in GDX, what you realize is they've all come back big. 
And you're talking major Fibonacci retracements, um, companies that are profitable, you know, because the price of gold is still up. Um, I think that this is a no brainer to add to uh, if you were trying to build a position. And I think if you don't have a position in gold miners, you should. Why? Because that digital gold thing is bullshit. Bitcoin is not a big deal. It's going to go down another, uh, it's at 4,000 ish right now. You know, maybe, maybe who knows, it could be a thousand points in either direction in 10 minutes. Um, but my charts say that Bitcoin is headed down to close to $1,000 a share. Why? Because nobody uses it. How many of you use it to buy a pizza? None of you. Maybe one of you has to make a point. Bitcoin is junk. Period. I've been with the, with the programmers. I've talked to bankers. Bitcoin is junk unless it gets adopted for use and it's not going to because the banking system and the billionaires and JP Morgan and central banks aren't going to let it. So really Bitcoin is a black market currency that is gradually going to get crushed and you'll find other digital currencies and other ways to do digital transactions, but it's going to be using currency regular dollars and euros and yen and yuan. And all of those currencies are going to get devalued over the next 10 years because the debts on the planet are massive and the population is aging and we have to pay for all of these retirement systems. Gold is going to go to $3,000 an ounce, maybe higher in the next several years. And for sure, whenever they do the big retirement system bailout, and these stocks are just going to keep dropping money to the bottom line. Because they've streamlined, they've consolidated, they've cleaned up their balance sheets over the last five years. Take a look at what happened to them. Right? They fell off a cliff. They spent a very long time cleaning up. They're ready to break out. What's going on right now, see that line? That's where we're at. You should be buying GDX right now if you don't own it. And if you own a single digit amount, like I said, we, we laid out in our webinar last Monday about how much of this you should own, depending on the type of portfolio you have. We started out talking about oil. I don't want to own oil stocks anymore because half of the industry is going to go bankrupt in the next couple of years, probably in the next year. The Invesco solar ETF has been on one of the best performers the last one and three, one, two and three years, last one and two years in particular. And there's a secular tailwind to solar and batteries. This is going to continue to be one of the fastest growing industries on the planet, if not the fastest. These companies are the survivors from two other wipeouts. They have good balance sheets, they have good growth, and there's just not all that much competition anymore. So that 26 to $30 range appeared to be the buy zone. I had that how many weeks ago that I tell you this, that was where it would come back to. And now it's at, uh, what are we at today? 26.34 right now? So you're right in that buy zone. So I think that you can buy solar, buy, buy tan, because solar and batteries have all the same upside catalysts as oil and gas without the secular headwind, right? Because oil and gas are at various stages of the end of their useful lives. Oil is going to have crashing demand and within 10 years. And natural gas, you know, we probably use that way past the middle of the century. But it just never has become and never will become the bridge fuel that we thought. Because... Two-thirds of coal power plants are being replaced by alternative energy, and 100% of all new generation on the planet is alternative energy, even with India and China still building a few coal power plants. But the coal power plants are going to go away, too, uh, because at some point there will be legislation to do it. There will be 
uh, countries that stop exporting coal like the United States. And if the United States puts pressure on the banking system through SWIFT, then there won't be any financial institution on the planet that can finance anything to do with coal. Expect those things to happen at some point. Will it happen in 2021 or 2025 or 2029? I don't know. But right now, uh, Joe Biden is starting to not only run away from Bernie Sanders and Sunday night will, you know, Sunday night's going to be a big deal whether or not Bernie can come back. Um, but right now, they both lead President Trump by, I think it's eight points to, to 15 points in every poll that I've seen. And that's public. And I've told you about the private polls that have never been wrong. So you should expect major policy changes next year from taxes to, reg- to regulation. This is a, a, a correction that is your chance to put your asset allocation in line with the major secular trends of the 2020s. And that should be the takeaway message here. As you're getting an opportunity, especially those of you who listen to me and we're 50 to 75% in cash, to realign your portfolio with the realities of the 2020s. Tech innovation, alternative energy, smart everything world, currency devaluation. And there'll be some resources that are, that become scarce, right? So there are things like copper and zinc that are probably super cheap and we should be looking at in the next couple of weeks. That's pretty much all I had today. Like I said, I'm in Phoenix. Everything that I was going to go to was canceled. Hanging out with family, uh, flying home a couple of days early, and uh, using a lot of uh, Clorox wipes. Uh, we wiped up. We got on the airplane. Uh, a, you know, a sixth of the airplane was empty. So my girlfriend and I got three seats instead of two. You know, people looked at us like they wanted to sit by us, and we just waved them off. Nah, we wiped down the whole section. We had our Clorox wipes out, gave them to other people, said, wipe them down. Uh, what was interesting is that uh, there was a, a warning from uh, a TAA, I think, uh, somebody that said uh, the overhead bins weren't getting clean as well as they thought, so be careful about the overhead bins. Uh, and then a couple of TSA people got infected. So be careful out there um, when you travel and uh, try to avoid traveling, the uh, social distance, social distancing. Um, If you think there's any chance that you've been infected, you know, don't go near any of your older relatives, especially anybody with COPD or any other type of health problem. Um, Just be conscientious of the fact that we don't know how many people are infected. It's probably thousands and thousands more than we, uh, you know, have numbers for right now because the testing hasn't been good yet. Uh, I've seen some models that show that within two to four weeks, uh, if the tests are available, we'll, we'll be showing over 100,000 infections. So that's 1,000 or 2,000 people that are probably going to die. So use this as positively as you can which is to realign your portfolio for the 2020s. Smart Everything World, alternative energy, handful of resources, uh, currency devaluation, which means gold. Uh, And I think the ETFs um, should be at the core of your portfolio. Even if you're mainly a stock person, you should have 25 to 50% of your money in ETFs because it eliminates the individual company risk. So most of my portfolios uh, are going to have about 50% ETFs and um, 50% stocks. And I'll have some pure ETF portfolios, folks under 100 grand. And then I have the retirement income options where I sell lots of puts because we're looking to generate big income. So if you're not selling a lot of puts, but you're in that 100 grand plus range and you want to start buying stocks, uh, this is probably a good time to buy from our three lists that I, that I you know, I shrunk down the very short list to be very shorter. Uh, we have 12 months on stocks. Then we have our top 10 growth stocks and our top 10 dividend stocks. It should be pretty easy for you to build a 20-stock portfolio from the must-own 
and then either growth if you're a growth investor because you're younger, or the must own, you know, and lots of the must owns pay dividends, um, plus the dividend list if you are a dividend investor. So I will uh, uh, take just a couple questions. Um, yeah, I still like uh, Sun Power. I've been buying it here uh, and selling puts uh, in the last week or two. Um, I, 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 I talked about GDX. Yep. Uh, you can sell puts on it if you like to. Uh, there is one lower um, support level on GDX. I mean, it can go one lower level. Uh, let me see here. Uh, it could get down to about here. Right? So you see here, you see here, the same line. So could the gold miners ETF go to about 18? Absolutely. But, you know, it's already at 21. So um, I would be uh, taking a look at the gold miners. Let's see the one-day chart, the daily chart. You know, it's down a buck today, 5%. Like I said, it can go down two or three more dollars. Um, but I think that this is a pretty good spot to get into it. Look, it's, it's super oversold on daily. You know, it's, it's right at oversold on the weekly, and at, after the close tomorrow uh, today, it'll be oversold. So we've got a daily and a weekly oversold on the GDX. I think that this is a good spot as any to buy. Um, are we in a recession? Or if we are in a recession of getting into one, how quick will the rebound be? I, I think my timelines have gotten changed by a few months. You know, I thought that we'd get a pretty significant boom after the election, um, but that we'd also get stock market uh, tax selling. I don't know if the tax selling is going to manifest as much as I thought it was going to because the embedded long-term gains, um, that's a lot of rich people in the last couple of months. Right? They were already selling in January. I've shown you those charts. So I don't know if there's a lot of embedded gains that have to be sold at the end of the year. Um, what we have to see now is, is there's just general tax loss selling. So you might see at the end of the year um, some of the stocks that people wrote up into the new year and bought late. Yeah, you just you know we'll have to pick them out issue by issue, but there could be tax loss selling at the end of the year. <laughs> Excuse me. That is not coronavirus. That is cur changing weather and having a head cold. Um, easy to breathe and no fever. Um, I think that what's going to happen at the at the election is that you probably have one bad day because it's going to be Biden or Bernie, and then you then it takes off and heads off to the races the same way it did after Trump got elected. That'd be my guess. I know, still, I know people still doubt that Trump is going to lose, but I'm, I'm telling you, he, he's, it's not even going to be close. That's how big the number differentials are that I'm seeing. He, 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 you can have to figure out something. I don't know how he's going to fix it. I hope he doesn't start a war. Um, although I do think the possibility of the pressure in the Middle East getting to Iran and Saudi Arabia um, I think it's quite possible. So those little flare-ups we've had in the last few years, you know, the possibility is still that it goes uh, much worse. I'm actually going to be talking about that on Monday. On Monday morning at 8 a.m. Central, I will be a guest on the Forex Analytics morning show. So I will post that um, in a blog um, tomorrow uh, if you want to hear what I have to say about oil in depth, and I'm sure you always ask me some good questions. Forex Analytics, um, 8 a.m. Monday. They also put their stuff on YouTube later in the day. So you'll be able to uh, catch that. Uh, how do you feel about going 80% or more in cash holdings of select few ETFs? Well, so 
I had people 75% in cash months ago. It's too late now. You have to look at the technical indicators that I've given you guys over and over again. You must use these signals. You must use the RSI, the CMF, and the MACD. You have to use those three things. I mean, it's about as simple as it gets. So on the daily, if you're looking to sell and the daily gets up here, the overbought, then you can go ahead and sell. But what determines whether or not you're looking to sell is what does the weekly and the monthly look like. You know, we can go all the way back here to, 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 um, to the S&P 500, right? Do you believe that this next level is going to come? You know, how far down does it go? We're already down 25%. Should have panicked when it was higher. So if we get a, a rebound rally and every bear market has these face ripping straight up rebound rallies, the fact that today's rally isn't stronger on news that the Fed and the government are coming to the rescue is interesting to me. So I do think we have another leg down. But I think that at these prices, the gold and solar ETFs, if you don't have have them, you nibble. And if you have just a little, you nibble a little bit more. Um, but I don't quite want to buy QQQ just yet. I don't want to buy ARC just yet. Um, I don't want to buy semiconductors just yet. Uh, but I think that's coming. I think, and I don't know this, but I think as the economic numbers and earnings numbers come out in April, that will probably be the blow-off bottom sometime in the second quarter. And I, I think you just have to hold your nose and, and buy it at that point. So if we get a rally short-term and you want to lighten up on some things that aren't real high quality, remember, corrections are a time to improve your quality and get in line with the real big trends. This is a chance to speculate less and take less risk. Um, I know a lot of you had cash before, so it's it's better for you, right, because you don't have to worry about should I still be trimming. For those of you that never really got a big cash position, like I said, take a look at your, your holdings, figure out, okay, what is lower quality, what's not on the side of the big trends, um, and what should I do about it? Right, I'd for sure be looking for a chance to get out of oil stocks. You know, I I, I just think that I I actually do think Occidental probably has to go through a reorganization. I just I have a hard time figuring out. You know, in hindsight, um, they made it sound like they had buyers set up for a lot of stuff, and they didn't. And that's a problem. I, I'm going to write a very critical article about Vicki Hullub and what she did. And I'm also going to write a, a critical article basically about just the oil executives in general. I think that shareholders need to be holding these oil executives accountable and doing clawbacks at a minimum but and getting fired, getting fired with clawbacks, no golden parachutes. Um, and some of them probably should get criminally prosecuted uh, or at least uh, civilly sued or come after by the SEC because they did not fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities. They lied to people like you and to people like me, and then I passed it on. And so I'm angry about that. But, you know, the reality is, is that the secular trend is against them. Uh, they were trying to skim money before it all ended. And that, that leaves a lot of bag holders. So I think oil and gas, Stocks are toast uh, for the most part. Are there going to be a couple trade opportunities in the future? For sure. Uh, do we get an oil price spike if there's a war? Yeah. Your guess is as good as mine if that war happens anymore. I still think it does. I just don't think Saudi Arabia and Iran can play nice. Um, it's not, it shouldn't so much be us, although we were bombing Iranian uh, militia positions in Iraq overnight. So who knows? The spy is down almost 8% from the open and falling rapidly. Yeah, you know, so what do we see here? 
Let's, let's do this the easy way. Let's do this the easy way. Is it back to negative already? Yeah. Yeah. So the market might not even open uh, end the day up today. It opened up. Like I said, I nibbled on some gold and solar, but I'm not ready to buy a QQQ. All right. Leave it at that. I think the message is pretty clear. Look for a lot of articles. Um, I didn't talk about many individual stocks today because for subscribers, that you deserve that information. I'm going to put that into articles and chart books. All right. Take care. Have a good weekend. Stay clean.